In 1927, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to Austrian doctor Julius Wagner Jurek for curing patients paralyzed by third stage syphilis by using malaria. See, in 1917, he discovered that an inoculation with malaria infected blood could induce such a high fever in a patient that it would kill the temperature sensitive syphilis bacteria, curing even third stage syphilis that was attacking the brain. There was only one problem the malaria tended to kill about 15% of patients. It was sometimes known as the killer cure. And another important thing, given that his patients were paralyzed and mentally ill, he did not get their consent before giving them malaria. Okay, so Austrian doctor, human experimentation, high death rates. This guy became a Nazi, didn't he? <coughs> to the shock of no one. This episode is sponsored by the Child and Teen Checkups Program of Minnesota. As a young adult, it's important to monitor your health, even when you don't feel sick, and you may qualify for free annual checkups. Learn more at u21checkups.com. By the time the 20th century rolled around, humanity had spent roughly 400 years battling syphilis with no effective treatment. However, there were some advancements made in the effort to combat it that proved important to other aspects of sexual health. For instance, syphilis inspired the invention and wide adoption of condoms, which by the 18th century were well known in most cities. Originally made with lambskin or animal organs, a common material for waterproof containers, they were partially effective at guarding against pregnancy and some diseases. But because syphilis spreads by skin-to-skin -skin contact, they weren't any use against it. Also, it should be noted that these early condoms were nowhere near as effective as the latex ones we use today, especially the ones that were made out of tree bark. Yeah, don't think about that one too hard. Syphilis and the rate of syphilis infection also began to become better understood, and the bacteria that caused it was identified in 1905, followed by a diagnostic blood test. Though even before that, groups were collecting information on rates of infection and finding shocking results. One study found that 50% of people seeking treatment in the British Indian Army were for syphilis. But a cure, a real working one, was on the way. In 1907, the Japanese researcher Sahachihiro Hata, working in the lab of German scientist Paul Ehrlich, discovered that a newly synthesized chemical was toxic to the bacteria that caused syphilis. And by 1910, it was in clinical trials under the name Salversan. This chemical compound was, as Ehrlich called it, a magic bullet that would kill the bacteria without harming the human body. It was one of the first blockbuster synthetic drugs, but there were also problems. It was distributed in powder form and had to be prepared without exposing it to oxygen. And improper preparation could cause rashes and liver damage, and it wasn't effective in treating the later stages of the disease. But even so, Salversan began the modern era of syphilis treatment. And just in time, because World War I was about to test this new wonder drug to its limit. Syphilis was common among the armies of the Great War. Soldiers visited brothels when off the line, and then lived in unsanitary close quarters while in the trenches. Roughly 5% of the British army became infected, and while new drugs meant that the disease was no longer that fatal, treatment still pulled men off the line for a month or more. In fact, some soldiers intentionally transmitted infections amongst each other by rubbing matchsticks on the syphilis sores and then passing them around since it gave them four weeks out of combat. This became such a problem in the French army that after two admissions for infection, a man's term of service would be extended to discourage the behavior. But to the rescue came Etty Rout, a volunteer nurse from New Zealand who'd seen outbreaks of sexually transmitted disease in Egypt and the Western Front and decided to do something about it. She began selling safe sex kits that included condoms and disinfectant and began inspecting brothels to ensure they were hygienic. The French army gave her an award, and New Zealand commanders secretly made her kits required. But when she wrote an article about her work for a newspaper back home, it caused such a scandal that the government declared that any paper that printed her name would be fined a hundred pounds. But her work would go on to heavily influence the American armed forces, who made it official policy in World War II that any STI would be treated without judgment and liberally distributed condoms to soldiers. And whenever a commander objected on moral grounds, the army simply claimed that the condoms were actually barrel covers to keep rain out of rifles while troops were marching. Wink, wink. And in 1947, doctors got access to a new weapon in the fight against syphilis, a game-changing drug that worked universally with few side effects and a drug that to this day has made syphilis survivable and easy to treat. Penicillin, probably the greatest invention of the entire 20th century. 
Salversan turns syphilis from a deadly lifelong curse to a treatable, albeit serious, disease. While penicillin turned it into something that can be killed quickly and effectively, provided it was caught. Which is what made the next chapter in this disease's tale so revolting. The Tuskegee Syphilis Study. Probably the most unethical medical study ever conducted in the United States. The Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the African American Male began in 1932 when the U.S. Public Health Service partnered with Tuskegee University to see what syphilis did to the human body. In doing so, the PHS tested 600 African-American men from rural Alabama for syphilis, finding that 399 of them were infected. But fearing they would get treated if they knew, the doctors instead told the men that they had bad blood, a non-medical term that included things like syphilis, fatigue, and anemia, and offered medical checkups, funeral expenses, and free lunches if they would agree to be monitored. The men were not told that they had syphilis, meaning they not only sustained damage to their bodies while being monitored, but that they also freely passed the disease to their wives and partners, and some children were born with the disease. It was supposed to last six months, then end with treatment. Instead, they continued the study for 40 years, never informing the patients the point of the study or that they even had syphilis. It was, someone later said, treatment by autopsy. In fact, researchers didn't just hide the diagnosis. They went out of their way to ensure these men didn't receive treatment. They went to town doctors and told them not to treat the study participants for syphilis or to inform them that they had it. When some participants enlisted in the army during World War II, researchers convinced military doctors not to treat them as well. And even when penicillin became available as a cheap and effective cure, and the public health service itself was setting up syphilis treatment centers, these men were allowed to suffer. Why? Doubtful scientific value aside, the fact was, these men were poor, rural, and black. So few people thought twice about the ethics of it. And even when researchers raised concerns or quit, they never went public. For years, papers about the study were published in medical journals without controversy. But that began to change. In the 1950s and 60s, a few PHS employees privately objected to the study. Yet it wasn't until Peter Buxton, a PHS employee fighting STIs in San Francisco, leaked it to the press in 1972 that anyone paid attention. The expose was so explosive that it immediately ended the study. Still, far too late for 128 of the participants who died of syphilis or related complications. The ensuing media firestorm led to congressional hearings on bioethics, a $10 million out-of-court settlement, and a promise by the U.S. government to pay lifelong medical expenses to the men and their families. President Clinton would formally apologize for the study in 1997. The Tuskegee study is one of the darkest chapters in American medical history, and one that still makes some in the African-American community skeptical of the medical establishment. But it also instigated a sea change in medical ethics. Research institutions developed new bioethical rules governing medical experiments and outlined that participants must be informed about the purpose of a study and its risks while agreeing to participate, giving what is known as informed consent. And these protections are now enshrined in law to prevent something like the Tuskegee study from happening again. But as for our old friend syphilis, it declined worldwide for the next few decades, with Cuba even eliminating mother-to-fetus transmissions through treatment programs. But sadly today, it's again on the rise. See, much like tuberculosis, doctors in the Western world stopped looking for syphilis and educating people about its symptoms, which are not always easy to identify. Not to mention the emergence of AIDS allowed syphilis to gain purchase on weaker immune systems. But the good news is that today, syphilis is easy, safe, and cheap to treat. No tree bark condoms, mercury, or malaria required. So the moral of the story is that if you're sexually active, use condoms and get tested. Treatments are easy and affordable, and you'll be keeping yourself and your loved ones safe. Until next time, everyone, stay healthy out there. Once again, thanks so much to Child and Teen Checkups Program for sponsoring this episode. Remember, we're all at our best when we stay in charge of our own health. And even as a young adult, it's important to get annual checkups because they're a great and proactive way of identifying symptoms, addressing concerns, and setting a baseline for a happy, healthy future. Plus, you may qualify for free annual checkups. You can learn more and get started today at u21checkups.com. That's the letter U, 21, checkups.com. We see you, Ahmed Ziad, Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscia, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles1. Thanks so much for being legendary patrons.